from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I'm joined today by Buzzy Cohen. Hello, Sarah. Thanks for having me back. I missed you last week. Oh, we missed you. But I love hearing from Michael. Love yeah. hearing what's in Did his mind. Did you take mind. a listen to the pod? Of course, I always listen. Oh, Devoted see? listener over here. Devoted listener. They also, I haven't missed one yet. You so. haven't missed one? <laughs> because I've been on every one of them. That's right. You're the anchor here. I'm the anchor. Yes, that's me. Well, our Deathly Double winner, oh, Mackenzie, yes. was very excited. Congratulations. Uh, she tweeted out, OMG, thank you, Jeopardy, for making me the winner of this year's contest. I am so happy. Thank you. Mackenzie, I or someone else will be in touch to get your home address to send you that photograph of Ken Jennings signed by Buzzy Cohen. Very, very rare. Yes, we brought you the photo today so that you Excellent. can sign that so that Excellent. we can get it right off to So it can actually to go to Mackenzie. Mackenzie. Hard to believe, Buzzy. We're just a few days away from Thanksgiving. Yeah, what are you what are you doing this year for Thanksgiving? Well, you know, we're staying home this year, having a little mom and dad joining. Okay. Cooking a big feast. Got the turkey ordered up yesterday. We talked about this last year. Yeah. We've we've been potting long enough that we're on repeat yes. of our holidays. Because yes. we had a brine battle. We last talked year brine about, last like, year. Your brine versus my brine. So anyway, we're doing all that again. Yeah. Cooking up a feast. Sounds Watching fun. Watching the parade, the Macy's parade in the morning. Got to. Got to do it. Got to do it. I am going to Florida this year. Oh, I think, change. I think, did I do that last year? No. Well, I'm going to Florida this year. All of my family and all of my wife's family have moved to Florida. Nobody originated in Florida. Huh. But not only do they all live in Florida, they all live in the same town in no. Florida. So we will be bouncing around Boca Raton. <laughs> For a week. Buzzy in Boca. I can Buzzy see it now. in Boca. Del Boca Vista. Um, so, yeah. But I, my mom is cooking Thanksgiving, although she has adopted my turkey brine and the oilless turkey fryer. Yes. The Big Easy from Charbroil, which That's I'm a I big remember. fan of. I also wanted to let you know about something fun and funny that has been going on yeah, around well, you. Yeah, you. you were busy reading out there before we started potting. So the avid Cohen heads out there, of which there are probably six, um, <laughs> will know <It's> from, <laughs> from my Twitter that uh, I have been reading a lot of short fiction this year. So I was talking with co-head writer Michelle Loud, and she was talking about how she hates short fiction. And I suggested one of the books that I really enjoyed. And so she's reading it, and she was talking to Ken about it. Ken and I had dinner last week. So he had heard about this from Michelle. And I said, oh, the next book I'm reading is this, you know, this book. And he's like, oh, I have that book too. I'm getting ready to read it. So Ken and I are sort of in a two-person book club, wow. and we are reading one short story a day and then texting about it the next morning and what we thought and how, how we liked it. You know? So that's what's going on. Okay. I like it. Well, we have some good highlights to get to as well. You know, it's not any uh, short fiction, but it's some great episodes of Jeopardy. Yes. We've got the Champions Wild Card. We've got the clubs. They're continuing in their quarterfinal games. And Celebrity Jeopardy returned last week with none other than Macaulay Culkin, oh my God. Rachel Dratch, and Becky Lynch. And later in the show, second chance winner and champions wildcard diamond group finalist Jelana Cotter is going to join us. Nice. Looking forward to that. But first, let's take a look back, Buzzy, at this week in Jeopardy history. Today, we're heading all the way back to Jeopardy season 29. <laughs> Kate Wilson, you wrote down your response quickly. What did you put down? You said, what is treason? You are correct. And your wager was 5,000. You doubled to 10,000 today. We add that to your total from yesterday. That was 3,000. You now have 13,000. Let's go down there to Michael Farabaugh. He had 8,600. We're looking for treason. Not literally, but we get it from you. And your wager, 5,500. That bumps you up to 14,100 today. You had 10,000 yesterday. That gives you a total of 24,100. Colby, over to you now. Did you get treason? No, you didn't. You got perjury instead, so it's going to cost you how much? 1,929. That drops you down to 18,671. But you'll recall, ladies and gentlemen, that he had 10,600 yesterday, and that takes him up to champion status, $100,000. <laughs> 50000 for Michael, 25000 for Kate. Congratulations, Colby. We'll look forward to having you back on our program in February. You're going to be competing in the Tournament of Champions. 
And we look forward to you people joining us again tomorrow. So long, everybody. That's right. It was on this day 11 years ago when Colby Burnett won the 2012 Teachers Tournament, taking home the grand prize of $100,000 and earning a spot in that year's Tournament of Champions. Colby, of course, went on to win that tournament, making history as the only Jeopardy! champion to have won both the Teachers Tournament and the Tournament of Champions. He later returned to compete in the Battle of the Decades. He was also a team captain, yep. along with team captain Buzzy Cohen here in the All-Star Games. His team composing of Pam Mueller and Alan Lynn. They made it to the finals. Oh, I know, that's tough to hear. Yeah. With Team Brad and Team Ken, and they took home the third place prize of $100,000. Colby later told us that, you know, when he initially won, he used his winnings to buy his mom a new house, and then he bought one of his own. And to this day, it still remains one of the proudest achievements in his life, the ability to help the woman who made him the person that he is. You know, Colby, once the five-game limit was lifted, you know, Jeopardy became a game that even if you win, they make you keep playing until you're a loser. Right. <laughs> as I'm so fond of saying. Yes. Colby was one of the few people until the Battle of the Decades yes. who could say in the post five game limit world, he had never lost a yes. game of Jeopardy. It was a good streak. And until I know that it ended, but it's it's cool to be able to say that. A lot of teachers tournament people really are looking to repeat that. You know, I I played a uh, very good teachers tournament player Jason Sterlocky in my tournament of champions and he was eyeing that championship. So I think you know, Colby has become an inspiration for the those teachers. And as we've seen Sam Buttry now, an inspiration from the professor's tournament. Yeah, often a good field for great Jeopardy! champions. Yeah. All right, Buzzy, it is time to get into our game highlights. We kicked off the week with Emily Fiasco, Stuart Crane, and Fred Nelson competing in our third quarterfinal game of the club's group. All three of our players started off strong, but Fred came out swinging in double Jeopardy with a big $5,000 daily double and 12 correct responses. Stuart followed suit with an even more impressive $10,200 daily double to close the game, but Fred was still able to keep that narrow lead heading into final. All three players correct, so it's Fred who tops off an impressive win. I don't know why this is coming up for me, but okay. as you know, I was a, a, a helper person on Celebrity Millionaire, which yes. is actually like the first time I a met Michael person. Davies. I don't think that's I don't what, what the job called. description was. It was like a buddy. It was like Sort of like a phone a friend, but yes, but you were in person. But we were in person, and we could help them through a, like a bunch of the questions. And I, I was with Hannibal Burris, and I believe he got out on a question about the word fiasco, which is the name <laughs> of the rattan holder of a bottle of Chianti. So Emily Fiasco, you're bringing me back to March thirteenth, twenty twenty. It was a memorable day, obviously, because COVID was about to it shut down It was the day the world, everything shut down. <laughs> and you played Millionaire right before that happened. That's right, with Hannibal Burris. Well, Emily, Fiasco was able to at least say bring it yes. on the last clues of both rounds. So she was bringing in a little Sam Buttry. In the postgame chat, Ken asked Stuart about that huge daily double. He said, you know, was it a tough choice going in on that daily double? And Stuart said, it's a second chance. you got to take advantage. So... I love that mindset, Stuart. I love it, absolutely. And look, I mean, he really made it an incredible game. Those final scores, both first and second place with over $40,000, yes. that's real deal. That reminds me of the gentleman who lost to James Holtzauer with over $50,000. Do you yes, remember that? I do remember that. And oftentimes his name is thrown into the hat yeah. when we talk about these second chances. They're like, what about those people that, yeah. that put up a fight against someone like James Holtzauer? Well, there's, a, there's still time. There's still time. Life is long. We're Let's moving move on, on to, to Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> Nick Casconi, <laughs> Brandon Deutsch, and Emily White. Brandon got off to a good start, taking a strong lead halfway into double jeopardy, but Nick then went on a tear at the end of the round, scoring 10 correct responses, including a big $5,000 daily double to take the lead back from Brandon heading into final. It all came down to that last clue. Brandon was incorrect. Nick was correct. He secures the win and his spot in the semifinals. Final Jeopardy clue was interesting to me. This was historic objects mm -hmm. category. The inscription on this made in 1753 concludes unto all the inhabitants thereof. Correct answer, Liberty Bell. Yes, and Nick said that he had recently visited the Liberty Bell, and Ken was like, did you actually read the plaque? He said, yeah, I did. I feel like we've had a lot of 
in-person sort of revolutionary era yes, stuff lately. Yes, like slumdog millionaire yes. moments. It's just another support of getting out there. Getting out there. And Ken, didn't Ken come up with a final Jeopardy last season that was about Paul Revere maybe or yes, something? Yes, that from, he experienced yeah. <laughs> when he was doing the tour of the Freedom yeah. Trail. You know, I also, I really um, connected with Emily here saying the wide world of trivia opened up for me after I was on. I had a similar experience. I wasn't a big trivia person and then once you're on jeopardy you kind of unlock this secret community and um i'm happy to hear that she's now got a regular all women uh pub trivia team yeah if you come across her team let it snow well that's one way to say it <laughs> yeah that's the family friendly that's version. The fa- yes sean um, connery would pronounce her it another name way. you know obviously the snl sketch being uh played on there all right, well, we headed into Wednesday with Leah Kalio, Kit Sikelski, and Henry Rosicki. This was another well-played game by all three players. Leah controlled the board most of the game, but Henry came roaring back toward the end of Double Jeopardy with the help of two big daily doubles, the last of which was on the final clue of the round. He took a narrow lead heading into final, but all three players were in contention. Unfortunately, final was a triple stumper, and it's Kit with that minimal wager who's able to secure the come from behind win going from third to first. Well, this is a little bit of a buzzy this is your life game here because mm. I was recently on a podcast <laughs> Trivial Warfare and played against Kit. Huh. Kit was very very good. And also Did you win, Buzzy? Of course I won. Did Kit win? No. Oh, I was you playing won against teams. her. Okay. I beat her. <laughs> um, but also Leah has created a trivia team with fellow season 32 champ Sally Neumann who I became friends with because we were in the same season we were champions in the same season we became friends so I actually got a chance to see my friend Sally because she was in town cheering on her I partner Leah yeah I love this you know her day job librarian but after the show she decided that she would co-found a pub trivia company in Seattle and she said, you know, that writing the trivia questions has actually made her a better contestant. A lot of people say that. Once you've written a, a question about something, it really sticks in your head. But congratulations, tough loss, both for Leah and Henry. But yes. as we've seen, some of these finals in Champions Wildcard have been very tough. Very and a tough. savvy wager from Kit, as Alex was so fond of saying. Yes, very savvy. All right, moving on to Thursday with Amy Beckerman, Tim Moon, and Scott Plummer. Amy found the first daily double and really never looked back, maintaining the lead for the entire game on her way to a runaway. Scott did have the chance to take the lead, but unfortunately missed two big daily doubles in double jeopardy. He was, though, the only one able to come up with the correct response in final, but it was really just for bragging rights at that point because Amy had locked up the runaway win, which was the first runaway of the club's group. Wow. And we actually had... You remember we had Hans Zimmer in Masters Masters, in primetime. And when we wrote that category, our writers were like, can we please ask him if he'll do an extra clue in the show? Because it's such a fun fact about Hans Zimmer. So it was in a pop music category. And obviously Hans presented it far better than I will. But he said, before scoring films, I could be seen tickling the ivories on this new wave classic by the Buggles. The first ever video on MTV. Of course, the response, what is video killed the radio star? This is one of my favorite facts. I've been using this for years, and now Jeopardy has just thrown it out there. I'm just trying to catch up with you, Buzzy. Uh, But this, I just, there's a lot of weird trivia about video killed the radio star. It was co written by two people. The Buggles was sort of a made up band to release the song because they were songwriters trying to get it picked up and no one would buy it. But then Bruce Woolley, who was the other songwriter, released his own version that's out there. So much knowledge. In that one I can't do anything you with. You have Buzzy. I know. And now we can't keep playing Jeopardy, but at least we have them daily. Just adding a little color on the here. Pod. I feel colorful <laughs> as we head into Friday. Daniel Maurer, David Ferrara, and Carrie Codwaller. This was another exciting game to end the week. Carrie was dominant throughout the Jeopardy round, ending with over $10,000, but Danielle slowly gaining ground with the help of a true daily double. Danielle and Carrie continued to battle it out, and by the end of the round, Danielle was within striking distance, so it all came down to final. Danielle, the only one to come up with the correct response, who is Peter Pan in the literary characters category. It was an exciting come-from-behind win for her. Yeah, this is one of those scoring situations where, because of the spacing of the scores, David is still very much in this game. As we see, Carrie 
in the lead has to bet ten thousand dollars to uh, secure the win mm-hmm. that puts her in striking distance of david doubling up unfortunately he was incorrect but you can see how even though david's only got six thousand dollars that looks like nothing compared to the 21 but because of danielle's great play as well david is in the game and i love games like that where really anything can happen at any moment well and for danielle you may remember she last played on the jeopardy stage against none other than Matea Roach, and it was a similar come-from-behind win. Ken caught up with the players after the game to discuss just that. Danielle, how are you feeling? That's your second uh, great escape on this stage. Well, you know, when I was doing the, the math, I was sitting here looking at it, and I was like, you know, this is a tournament. It really doesn't matter if I'm first or second place. Go big or go home. <laughs> and, um, I, and I felt good about literary characters. So the last time I was here when I beat Matea, the category was USA, which could be anything. <laughs> but uh, Matea's Canadian, you already had the, well, that's li- you already had the edge there. <laughs> but I saw literary characters, and I was like, well, I read a lot, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, against Matea, I think you lucked into a Final Jeopardy clue about your hometown airport. <laughs> Were you hoping for another, more Atlanta material I here? I did not expect to get that lucky twice, no. <laughs> but no, we've shown that even on non-Atlanta Final Jeopardies, I can uh, do it. You, know, and that you was can a take thing. out very strong players. I didn't do very good on finals when I was here for my original run, so I'm, you know, redemption arc here. I got the finals. All right. Well, that's it for regular Virginia or regular (laughs) Jeopardy. Now we're going to head into Celebrity Jeopardy. It was last Wednesday in primetime where Macaulay Culkin, Rachel Dratch, and Becky Lynch took the stage for our seventh quarterfinal out of nine quarterfinals that we're going to feature. Macaulay Culkin telling us he wanted to play as Mac. So from now on, that's Matt Culkin, Your if, you pal, were, Mac. if you're listening. Mac and Rachel battled neck and neck throughout the first two rounds, and Mac took a small lead heading into triple jeopardy. But then Rachel just went on a tear. 14 correct responses really got her buzzer mojo going. Two daily doubles. She took a strong but not insurmountable lead heading into final. But all three players were correct. Rachel did her math perfectly, and she secures the win by just $1. What a game. What icons we have here. Yes. And, you know, Becky Lynch, during her first interview, was in the red. And she just said, you know, she's used to these crazy arenas and everything. Like, we had to get a little bit more ruckus Mm -hmm. and rowdy. You know, Ken joked, like, maybe we should start throwing some chairs and ladders around (laughs) to make her, you know, she's used to the WWE. Yeah. Well, and that happens sometimes when you've got two players who are really in the zone. It's kind of hard to find your mojo. You don't have those opportunities to kind of figure it out and it seemed like Rachel and Macaulay were really in the zone great yeah. great numbers it really could have gone to either of them a great game and Rachel heads on to the semifinals which will begin once we conclude our nine quarterfinal games we do have a repeat of Celebrity Jeopardy this week with Thanksgiving but we'll be back with our eighth and ninth quarterfinal games after that and then we're going to bring you three semifinals then we'll play the final Oof. one hour episode and one of our celebrities is going to get one million dollars for charity now you're not going to say who won obviously you know no yes however we have been teased that ike Barinholtz, who won the last tournament will want to appear in the tournament of champions oh that's right is there a sense that this champion is interested well this champion will qualify for the next tournament of champions okay so okay. this coming up tournament of I champions in spring of 2024 Just ike. It's just going to be Ike, along with a pool of other exciting, yeah. awesome champions. We've teased it. It's going to be the biggest pool ever. I can't wait. I can't either. I know nothing about it. As usual, I'm in the dark, and I get to be excited along with yes, all of like our listeners. Yes, we like to keep you in the dark. Yeah, so, so you, you get, get those excited. real authentic yes, reactions. That's what we are here. We're authentic. That's what they tell me, at least. Ah, yes. <laughs> all right. It is now time for our host chat. An audience member asked Ken, Are there any Seattle Thanksgiving traditions? Seattle Thanksgiving traditions. Wow. I don't know. I mean, Seattle's changed so much. It used to be like a Scandinavian uh, fisherman's village. So I'm sure they were eating, you know, herring pie or something for uh, (laughs) something awful for Thanksgiving. No, and the Seahawks hardly ever play on Thanksgiving. I guess our tradition is watching the Lions lose just like the rest of America. (laughs) And, And watching the parade on tape delay just like you do here. So it sounds like it's not specific to Seattle, Ken's yeah. Thanksgiving traditions, but he's just doing expected, what we all do. Yeah, you know? I expected like a turkey stuffed with Dungeness crab or something. 
Really? Yeah. I think they like their seafood up there. Yeah. I, yeah. I was texting with Ken during COVID. And I know he ordered, there's like a big seafood restaurant there and they were doing kind of like oyster and, you know, kind of a raw bar delivery kind nice. of thing. And uh, I know he did that a few times. So I've never been to Seattle. Really? Yeah. No one's ever invited me. Well, don't go for Thanksgiving because they're not doing anything too special up there. All right, Buzzy, I know you have to run, yes. but I want to wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving. I've got a lot of reading to do. Thank you. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you and yours as well. Thanks, Buzzy. All right, now I would like to welcome second chance winner and champions wild card finalist Jelana Cotter to the pod. Jelana, thank you so much for joining us. How have you been since we saw you last on the Alex Trebek stage? Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, things have been great. I'm gonna have a baby in a few weeks hopefully <laughs> we'll see when he arrives but yeah the whole experience with my jeopardy episodes actually being on tv has been wild but good actually better than i expected i was much more nervous i think about uh having my, the games i played be on tv than i was about actually playing them you know you're not the first person to say that that even though you played them and you know how they go Mm -hmm. Just watching them on TV brings about a whole different level of anxiety and nerves. Yes, yes, because it's sort of like, well, okay, I know what I did, but although usually after you play, you don't remember anymore whatsoever. <laughs> um, but then having everybody in the public see what you did and thinking, well, you know, are people going to scrutinize the mistakes I made? At least for me, it's easy to like see the downsides more. Uh, but people have been extremely kind and much more positive than I imagined. I'm not really used to a lot of public attention. Well, I'm glad you're receiving it, and I'm glad it's been positive because certainly you have done a lot of great things on the stage since your initial appearance. I want to take us back to season 37. First of all, you were here with a different name. It was not Jelana Cotter back in 2020. Yeah, so my name before I got married was Jelana Rose Silverberg, which... I mean, I hardly have an unusual first name. And then my last name was <laughs> even more unusual. <laughs> you know, my first experience, it was it was good, but it was hard because, you know, you go into it and you don't go into it thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm going to lose. <laughs> but, you know, that happens for the majority of the people who play Jeopardy is you, you go and you have your one game and you might get beaten by somebody who's really good. And the people I played against in my first game were really good. The returning champion from that one, Morgan Bryles, uh, she, we saw her in the uh, spades bracket of Champions Wildcard. And uh, Nick Cascone, I hope I'm saying his last name right, you know, he's won his quarterfinal in the, in the club's bracket. And oh my gosh, he was so hard to play against. <laughs> uh, so we were all sitting in the audience because it was all separated out because of all the COVID regulations, there were no audience. The audience was just fellow players. And so Nick is sitting there with a book studying. And then we all get on stage and then he's so fast on the buzzer. Just there's no way I can catch up. And there were categories for things I was really not good at. So it was, it was a struggle. And it was a long day because, you know, the guest host era, the host is learning the game at the same time you are. And so taping goes very late at night and I... I played the Friday game, which is the last game taped of the day. I mean, it was a wonderful experience, but it was really hard, too, because you're sort of, you have this extra long day sitting there getting nervous. And then, you know, I, I went up on stage and it was fun. And my competitors were amazing and super nice. But, you know, it's kind of hard on you when you, you have all this anticipation and it's like a big build up all day long and then you just drop <laughs> I will admit I was I was pretty sad about it for a while and I kind of took some time off from watching Jeopardy and that I, I did get back to watching but it was it was a little while before I, I felt uh, I felt good watching the show again. Well, that's understandable. I mean, that was a great game for all three of you. Everyone ends with over twenty thousand dollars, a score that on any other day would be a champion score, and you leave thinking, "Wait, that was it." Yeah, I was. I remember thinking at the end of the game, oh, I wish I could play again because I feel like I just finally figured out how to do this. Family friends would say, oh, so when are you going to be back on? And I would be like, that is the one thing I'm never allowed to do because once you lose <laughs> on Jeopardy, I mean, unless you're like going to the Tournament of Champions, once you lose, you're done. 
Uh, and so that was really sad. And, you know, as a, as a couple of years went by, it was it was definitely easier to deal with, but I was, I was still kind of sad about it. And so getting another chance was like, I could not believe it. I had no idea what they could possibly be calling me about. A few things had changed, obviously. You know, so we give you a call. You have a new name and you're pregnant. And oh, by the way, we want you to fly to L.A., to be on second chance. <laughs> yes. So fortunately, I, you know, I got the call when I was in the doctor's office waiting room for a checkup, and you know, I didn't know what Jeopardy was calling me about, but I had planned to ask my doctor anyway. What you know, what's the <laughs> latest you're allowed to fly when you're pregnant? Because I didn't know, and I was thinking, oh, maybe I might go like visit family later in the year or something like that, and I want to make sure the timing's okay. <laughs> and so then I get out of the appointment and I call, <laughs> I call back, and. You know, I was just flabbergasted. So what do you do in that time? You know you're coming back. What do you do in those weeks leading up to your return? I studied a lot. <laughs> a lot of flashcards. You know, I, I watched games of Jeopardy, uh, and I practiced buzzing in while I watched, and I watched it standing up with a chair in front of me to sort of, like, mimic the podium. And so I practiced buzzing in with the <laughs> with the toilet paper holder. Um, but I did a lot of flashcards too. And I, I tried to focus on both, you know, things that I didn't feel as confident about and also things that are just common subjects to come up for Jeopardy. And so I, I studied that a lot and I was able to answer several questions in my games correctly because of having studied flashcards on them. And I practiced buzzing in while I did the flashcards too. So I would be like, at my in-laws house for family dinner and we're like you know we haven't started eating yet and so here i am on my phone like flipping through flashcards <laughs> practicing stuff well emily sands told us that you were one of the folks in the contestant green room with their study materials out i learned that from nick who i played in my first game because he had a book to study from and he beat me and i thought this is a great idea you know it it did help because if you're looking at something right before you go on stage you know, you have a little bit better chance of it sticking in your head. I was thinking about before we had the, this interview, you know, some of the things like that I've learned from my fellow contestants and Yoshi Hill from the Diamonds Group. She has the strategy of she does not do specific studying at all. She learns everything in context. So she just like reads stuff and does crossword puzzles and goes about her normal life, like absorbing information constantly. And that's how she learns all sorts of stuff. And then she knows stuff that like nobody else knows because of this. And... You know, however much you study for Jeopardy, the majority of the questions you answer are not going to be things that you specifically studied for right before you went on the show. They're going to be things that you picked up randomly throughout the course of your life. And it's going to be something you learned in school or something you read a book about once. The sort of lifelong knowledge base uh, is really important for Jeopardy. And that's why I, I think being able to pick up one of those... It, you know, is is very important. Yeah, we see that with all of our Jeopardy! champions. You know, you are people who just are curious about life. You're interested in so many things. And when you hear an interesting fact, you're able to retain it. And I think that obviously was proven, whether it was your flashcards or your lifetime love of knowledge, you come into Second Chance and you pull off a runaway win in your first game. You're now a Jeopardy champion. How did that moment feel? I got lucky like with the runaway because <laughs> it was only because my opponents missed daily doubles. I remember talking with my mom afterwards. She was in the audience. Like Elaine could have easily beaten me in that first game if it weren't for one daily double she had that just tripped her up. And that that would have been the end of my of my second Jeopardy experience. I hope I don't take it for granted because my first Jeopardy experience was losing. And it made me realize, like, the phrase talking about the NFL saying, you know, on any, on any given Sunday, any team can beat any other one. Jeopardy is a lot like that. You know, with the exception of a few super champions, although even they lose eventually, for most of us, you get just different luck on the categories or slightly different buzzer timing. One person finds daily double and one person doesn't. And the entire outcome of the game changes. So I was really excited to win the first time, but it was just luck. Well, one thing I know about Jeopardy contestants, you always want to play again. So that wins yes. for you, whether you want to call it luck or whatever you want to call it, 
It guaranteed you two more opportunities to play Jeopardy in our two-day total point affair final. And day one, obviously a good one for you. You head into day two with a strong lead. Just talk me through how you're feeling in that finals. I was feeling nervous. I didn't know if I could win or not. Um, I remember being surprised but happy that I was in the lead uh, going into final Jeopardy on the first day. The category was composers. And I remember from conversations we had in the green room, I knew that McCall knew a lot about opera. And I figured, well, she probably knows a lot about classical music, like in general. And so I thought, well, she's probably going to get it right. And I'm ahead. So I need to, and this is probably a decent category for me. So I need to bet big, you know, because who knows what's going to happen in the next game. So I need to like leave myself a cushion. I think we all got it right. Yeah, so I was I was really excited about that. And the second game, you know, it was hard to buzz in. And then Final Jeopardy, apparently the between the two games, it was a runaway, but I didn't realize that. So you didn't know heading no. into Final Jeopardy <laughs> that you had won this thing. You had lapped it up. Yes, this was the beginning of my continuing struggles with <laughs> wagering correctly in Final Jeopardy, which I know the, the internet armchair Jeopardy players just cannot believe it. And... You know, it's funny because I have a sort of math adjacent day job. So normally I'm pretty good at math, but apparently once I get up on the podium, it's just like all bets are off. I can no longer do it. <laughs> and I just remember thinking like I was trying to calculate what I should wager. And I was like, these numbers are not adding up. I don't understand what is going on. So I just like wrote something down and hope for the best. And fortunately, none of us had seen Hamilton. <laughs> we all missed it because if, if we hadn't all missed it, then I, I wouldn't have won. But I was so excited to have won. It was the most incredible feeling, but also it's just hard to believe. Hey, wow, I'm I'm coming back. Yes, and you're coming back. And right there with Ken, you know, you said, I'm going to have to talk to my doctor and see, you know, how late I can fly because we actually were going to have you in the November tapings. I, I knew that the, you know, the, the winner of, of that second chance week was supposed to be in one of the later the later taping groups and the Jeopardy contestant department, who I, I think are just absolutely wonderful. I, I loved all of them. They were so good. Um, were extremely accommodating and said, you know, we'll put you in either of the first two groups, you know, take a day or two to decide and then let me know which one you'd rather be in. So that was, that was really great. Unfortunately, I picked the second one because the first one I would have had like a week turnaround. <laughs> so yeah, I went home and I, I studied more. I probably should have studied wagering more than I did because uh, <laughs> the whole tournament, like looking back on it, both of them, I made up for my lack of wagering skills with luck and knowledge. <laughs> so I guess that's my advice to future Jeopardy contestants. It's important to, to know things, but it's also important to study up on your wagering strategy because it can make or break a game and it doesn't matter how much you know. If you mess that up, then it's going to be hard to come back from that. Well, as if the show isn't hard enough, then you have to think about math as well. So you come out for the Champions Wild Card. You're in a tough quarterfinal game. You almost pull off a runaway, though. Steve comes in with the last clue. So now it's all going to come down to final jeopardy. Steve is incorrect. You secure the win. Again, I think... It was honestly just dumb luck that I beat him. I remember seeing the clue and thinking, well, Bob Dylan is the only singer-songwriter I can think of with a Nobel Prize in literature. I didn't know he had an Oscar, but I figured this is as close as I'm going to get, so I'm going to put it down. And I think he knew that Dylan hadn't attended the Nobel Prize ceremony, and so he thought he'd refused it. Anyway, so he knew way more about this than I did. That was the only reason I won, is because I didn't know enough about it to confuse myself. That looking back every game... I played against such amazing people, they could have so easily gone another way. So I I don't want to be like, oh, yeah, I'm great, because everybody I played (laughs) against was great. Well, you were the only one to come up with the correct response in that final, and now you're headed to the (laughs) semifinals. This was another tough game. I mean, we've said the competition in these champion wild cards is incredible, and your Diamonds group will say that, you know, your competition in particular is better than (laughs) any of the others. But in that game, you're in the lead heading into final. You actually miss wager again. Yes. So if Dave had been correct, you would have tied. But he was not. And you're once again the only one who is correct. And he did end up wagering less in Final Jeopardy. So I I guess (laughs) 
given his wager, we wouldn't have ended up tying. But like I said, there are all these sort of complicated wagering strategies. That one I was so surprised to win because playing against Dave Pye reminded me of playing against Nick in my original game in that I just could not keep up on the buzzer. He's so fast. And I just like, I was astounded that I won. You know, it's just luck. You know, if your opponents are faster than you, but then don't get the daily double right, that's kind of the only thing you can hope for if you're out buzzed. But I was not feeling very well that day. Uh, I was having a lot of pregnancy related uh, <laughs> maladies. That and then the two games of the finals were all taped on the same day. And that was, that was a long, hard day. <laughs> Well, at Emily Sands, and we spoke with her last week, she said, you know, I know when I was pregnant, I was like down a few brain cells. So the fact that Jelana was able to be at such a high level while pregnant made it all the more impressive to her. I'm going to say Emily and all, all of the other contestants have just been so nice. Everybody was so kind. And the, the Jeopardy staff, too, just been like incredibly kind. I guess I can't really tell if I've had a lot of like <laughs> mental lapses from being pregnant, but definitely like physically I could feel like I was a lot more tired. I was nauseous. I had horrible heartburn. And so that was kind of distracting, I guess. I don't know how I did it. Well, we head into the finals. You know, you've mentioned you did not sleep well the night before. You have all the things going on. And now you're in the finals with Aaron Craig and Emily Sands, both very strong players. Oh, yes. And you've got to play back-to-back -back games against yes. them. Talk me through those finals. I was so intimidated. You know, they both won in runaways. And I, like, just barely squeaked by with my win. Um, but, you know, so then my first game against them, like, I played really well, but also really terribly. Well, there was that daily double, that $9,000 daily double. Oh my gosh. Yeah. As soon as I saw the question, I thought, why did I bet so much? Because we've already talked about all of Camus' books that I'm familiar with. It's not like I haven't heard of Star Trek, but I just couldn't, like, I drew a blank and I could not think of him as that was terrible. And then I didn't even remember until I rewatched the game, but then apparently I missed a $2,000 clue because I was like a fraction of a second late answering right after that. So, you know, I, and between the two of those, my score drops by 11,000 and we get to final Jeopardy and I'm trying to do the same strategy that I did in the finals of the second chance tournament, which is bet big so that you have a cushion going into day two because you never know what's going to happen. I see the question and I was like, oh good, I know this. And I start writing down my answer really fast, but I'd misread question. Oh my gosh. Yes. It was terrible. Let's remind everyone at home. World history is the category. This African capital renamed an area Mexico Square to honor Mexico's World War II era support of its sovereignty during Italian occupation. And you think Ethiopia. Okay. So I think, <laughs> great. My dad had a coworker whose family was Ethiopian. And I remember her talking one time about, you know, Italian occupation of Ethiopia during World War II. And I get so fixated on that. I I had completely forgotten the beginning of the sentence, which is the capital. And so I write down my answer really quickly. And then I'm just like standing there, smiling at the camera like an idiot. Well, and we can see you writing. So we see you write right away. And we're thinking, oh, no, no, she's going to realize. She's going to realize and she's going to cross it out. I know. <laughs> Ken said he was really hoping that I would realize my mistake and because there was plenty of time to fix it. And I did not. You know, as soon as the answer was revealed, I thought, oh, my gosh. I cannot believe I did this. This is like the most embarrassing thing. But the only thing I could think to make myself feel even slightly better is like, maybe it's possible that even if I had read the clue right, I would have just like had a brain fart and not remembered the capital of Ethiopia, which also would have been pretty bad, but maybe slightly less embarrassing. <laughs> Yes, Addis Ababa did not come to mind in that moment. So you're down to 3,000. Yes. Ugh. You had bet 8,000 on that. And so you're heading into day two with $3,000. I have to say, though, here you are, you know, you get two daily doubles. And all of a sudden, you have 24,000 heading into final. And you realize if you bet big, you can win this thing. Yes. So before Emily's score changed with the, the infamous uh, Corpus Colossum, I, I would have had to wager it all in order to have a chance of winning. So then it was down to, you can either bet everything and have a chance at winning if I'm right and Emily's wrong. But if I'm wrong, whether Emily's right or not, then I'm going to be in third place. Or I could just bet zero and have a guaranteed second place. I thought, well, you know, I could 
play for the guaranteed 50,000. But I really love playing Jeopardy. And I really want to keep playing Jeopardy. Because at this point, I was having so much fun. And I thought, you know, this is a no-brainer. I'm going to wager it all and hope that I have a chance to keep playing more Jeopardy. And then Emily's score changed. And apparently, I, again, didn't realize until the game had aired, that there was a um, dollar range where I could have I could have wagered a little bit less and, you know, kept myself guaranteed second place or first place. I didn't have to wager at all. But honestly, the thought didn't even cross my mind because I was so focused on my like all in wager. You're either going to win it or you're in third place. And these are just the only two options. I was sad for you that you did end with a third place prizing because you really were a second place finisher in that final and not taking anything away from Aaron Craig. But I thought, you know what? That's how she had to play the game because she's playing to win. So one thing that's interesting, every game you've ever played, and you've talked about this, yes. is in position number two, yes. podium number two. I mean, I don't know what we'd do, Jalada, if you came back as a returning champion. By the time the finals rolled around, I was really happy to be in the middle because I was like, you know, it's just going to throw me off if I'm anywhere else because this is the only spot I've played Jeopardy from and I don't really want to do anything else that's going to distract me. That was actually really helpful to have the consistency that you you just minimize distractions and I'm only thinking about the game. You know, you got to take away any variables that you can in Jeopardy. We've talked about it a little bit, but We've had a few people from your diamonds group on the pod and the camaraderie that everyone is talking about and the text, the group text chain and, <laughs> and all of it. Is it as good as it sounds, Jelana? Yes, absolutely. It is really nice because everybody understands the same experience. It is really enjoyable because this is a group of extremely smart people who other than a love of Jeopardy, maybe do not have very much at all in common, you know, but we all, we all have a great amount of respect for each other and liking for each other. And uh, Jeopardy is kind of a great cultural uniter of people who, yeah. you know, otherwise would never meet and maybe not have very much else in common, but this sort of love of knowledge and wanting to be able to challenge yourself to see how much you can know against other smart people. It sounds like your little baby boy is going to have 26 honorable <laughs> aunts and uncles. Yes, yes. <laughs> so now it's time for the hard-hitting question. I'm sorry that Buzzy isn't here to ask <laughs> it, but what is your Jeopardy lunch order when you're on the Sony lot? Um, I do not remember what I ate during the second chance tournament. During the Champions Wild Card, first day, I think I got tacos. They were good. Uh, Thursday, so the day that the the semifinals and the finals were taped, I had such terrible heartburn. I thought I gotta find something like as plain as possible. No more tacos. So I think I had like a, a chicken caprese sandwich. You know, I think those are both nice, safe choices. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Best responses I've heard in weeks. I have to say. <laughs> what is your Jeopardy stat that you are the most proud of? I think one of my games, ironically, like the the game where I made all the really bad mistakes in the first game of the finals. My Coriant score was really good. So I'm, pr I'm proud of that. I had really high buzzer attempts on that one. Emily and I both did. 55. Like, yeah. And although I will say, I felt like, I remember Ken told us after one of the games, he was like, this is like for both of you, like tournament of champion level numbers. And I remember thinking, yeah, but I'm pretty sure I buzzed in on things that I didn't turn out to know. And I'm really glad I didn't <laughs> get in first. I guess it's sort of the imposter syndrome striking again. The feeling like, oh, well, you know, like the stat says it's really high, but I don't know if it like all of you this imposter syndrome. I know. I just want to. I know this is like the take classic, it away. the classic <laughs> smart person thing where you're like, yeah, I'm smart, but there are all these other people around me, and they are so smart. You know, you 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 go through your life, and people are like, oh, you're a smart person, and then you show up at Jeopardy, and it's like everybody is a smart person at Jeopardy, like. <laughs> And some people are insanely smart. It is a humbling experience, and then it makes it even more surreal when you do manage to win. Well, last question. What has been the best moment of your Jeopardy journey over the last couple of years? The person I have to credit with basically all of my Jeopardy success is my mother. She has been watching Jeopardy every day for more than 30 years, and she is insanely smart. Actually, interestingly enough, 
my mother is in the Jeopardy contestant pool, ah. you know, and she said, you know, there have been a lot of like parent child pairs on Jeopardy, but I'm pretty sure that if they called me, I would be the first one where the child was on before the parent. <laughs> but my mom is really the person who has inspired the love of Jeopardy with in me because I watched it every day with her. And, you know, she knows so much. It's thanks to her that I know a lot of things, her excitement and me getting on. And then she got to um, travel to California with me for the second chance tournament. And that was so wonderful. Being able to, to share that with my mom has been probably the best part of my Jeopardy experience. And I guess just getting to play so many games. Like I, I've played in eight Jeopardy games now and almost nobody gets that opportunity. Being able to not just play again once, but play again repeatedly has been so joyful and so much fun. I feel so fortunate that I, I got to play so many games. Well, we're gonna thank Jelana's mom. <laughs> It's thanks to her that we've had you. It's been so much fun watching you in both of these competitions do so well. We want to wish you the best of luck. We'll be expecting a baby photo in the next Thank few you. weeks. Thank you. The I next Jeppa along. baby will be coming soon. <laughs> thanks so much for joining Thank us, Jelana. That brings us to the end of today's show. Join us next Monday for more Champions Wildcard highlights for the clubs. Plus, we'll be speaking with Diamonds finalist Aaron Craig. As always, subscribe to the podcast and follow us at Jeopardy on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, on TikTok, and on X. And have a happy Thanksgiving. See you next week. Ken, what's that thing the kids say? You mean smash the like, subscribe, and bell button so you'll be the first to know when we upload more great videos? Yeah, that's it. Do that. <laughs>